He is in control of life and death. So the point is this. If God is aware of a sparrow falling or ants or anything like that, rest assured he's aware of every heartache, every trial, every problem we're dealing with. He's with us each step of the way. That's a comfort to me. We have a God that is active in our lives, that cares about our lives. He is not some distant God, some detached God that goes on vacation and has to catch up on what we're about. Our God is actively involved, and I say hallelujah to that. This morning, I mentioned the fact that in a few weeks we'll be celebrating Easter. Passion Week is what they call it. From the moment Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to the following Sunday when He rose from the dead, a whole lot of things took place. And trying to condense all those things and cover all those things, if you preach on Palm Sunday that morning, there's a whole lot that happened in between. So the next few weeks, I want to just touch on different things. No chronological order. Just on some of the events. This morning we looked at the raising of Lazarus, which took place a week before Jesus entered Jerusalem. It was like the last miracle he did before he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And tonight I want to look at something that took place on the cross. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Beginning with verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was a high day, they besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith is true, that you might believe. For these things were done, that the scriptures should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. Two prophecies concerning the Lord that he fulfilled exactly like they said it would. 900, 800 year old prophecies Jesus fulfilled. Wonderful thing. Throughout Jesus' three and a half year ministry, he said many profound things, many great things, spoke a multitude of wonderful words. One fellow stated in John 7 46, never a man spake like this man. And he was telling it right here in this passage of Scripture. The Lord Jesus' words are some of the greatest things he had ever said. Three simple words. This morning we looked at the shortest passage of Scripture. Jesus wept. It's one of my favorite passages, and here's another one. Jesus, while hanging on Calvary's cross, uttered the words, It is finished. Now, many wonder, what did he mean by that? What's finished? Who's finished? And I would like to look at this from a couple different angles as what Jesus was talking about when he uttered those three simple words. First of all, I want to share with you what it doesn't mean. Those who are lost, those who are walking in spiritual darkness, they will try to say that Jesus' words were words of defeat, words of a broken man who had lost everything. You hear, sometimes you read these quotes of famous people and their dying words. They said that during that stock market crash, uh, Black Friday, many businessmen, before they jumped out the window, uttered the words, I'm finished, I'm done. 
I've got nothing to live for. And they jumped out the window, having lost everything in the stock market crash. You'll hear famous people say the words, life isn't worth living, I'm finished. And many folks will try to say that when Jesus said those words, that he was uttering words of defeat. And I'll just tell you, not only are they wrong about that, but I got a really problem with these, these crucifixes that show Jesus hanging there. And I've seen some gruesome ones where he had this figure, face of agony, this face of defeat as he's just hanging on that cross like, like a defeated person. They want to be true to the scriptures. They should be having an empty tomb hanging on the wall because that's not the end of the story. Him, uh, he didn't die defeated. He rose from the dead the third day. Yep. And if you want to be accurate, that empty tomb is what we should be thinking about, not yep. a crucifix. Jesus did not say, I am finished. And there's a big difference in that. He said, it is good. finished, not I am finished. That's and that's finish. a huge difference. In fact, the term, it is finished, as it's used here, is a very expressive term in the Greek language. It was used when a servant had completed some job or task. The task is done. My work is finished. That's what it meant. It was used by artists after they had finished, put the finishing touches on their canvas. They would work on a painting for a while, but when the painting was done and they knew it was done, they would step back and say the words, Testelosai. My work is done. The canvas is finished. It was a term used by merchants when a deal was completed. It was a done deal. Which means Jesus' words were not the cry of a defeated man, but instead the shout of a victor. They were the words of victory. With those words uttered with his dying breath, Jesus was telling the world that something great had been accomplished. It was done. When Jesus said, it is finished, it represented several different things. Number one, his suffering was finished. Not too many movies really show you what Jesus endured. I can only watch the passion when I'm in a special mood because it's gruesome. But that's how it was. These movies growing up where Jesus would have a little blood right here and a little blood right here, a little, little blood dripping here, are so far from the truth. But they had to sanitize the story because people wouldn't have wanted to watch it. But if you've ever seen that movie, The Passion, that was about as close as you could get in depicting the fact that he was shredded from head to toe. He was beaten. Not just a little slap across the face. These soldiers were punching him till his eyes were probably puffed shut till his lips were probably swollen, till his face was battered and bruised as they played blind man's bluff with him, blindfolded him, spun him around, and said, if you're really a prophet, tell us who he at this time. Would have blown their minds, because you know what? Jesus could have said, I know who did it. Demetrius, that was you that just hit me. Thomas, that was you that just hit me. Would have blown their minds, but he could have done that. But he wasn't about to be playing games with those Roman soldiers. Then they cruelly mocked him, took a crown of thorns, something like that, except the thorns were probably twice the size of those. And they didn't delicately put it upon his head like you would place a crown upon a king. They took that crown of thorns, slammed it onto his head to, so those thorns would pierce that thin membrane of skin and the blood would run down into his eyes and his face, causing him to even more not see. And then they, would, they took a staff, a wooden stick, as a scepter and hit him over the head with that with that scepter further driving those thorns into his skull they took a robe and mockingly said hail king of the jews they only knew they were talking to the king of the jews then jesus was scourged scourged with a cat of nine tails whipped from head to toe and again that movie depicted the fact that he was just nigh to death god wasn't going to let him die but as they whipped him, they weren't about to stop. Many never made it to the crucifixion. They died from blood loss or from shock to the body. Lastly, he was tortured by one of the most barbaric forms of execution known to man, crucifixion. 
I've preached before on the medical aspects of the crucifixion, step by step what took place, and it's, it's horrific yeah. what he endured. Pain. Death came slowly and painfully as the victim slowly suffocated. The only way they could get breath would be to lift themselves up on those pegs that their feet were on, grab a quick breath, and then drop back down. We saw in this passage that to hasten death, the soldiers would break the legs of the victims. When the legs were broken, death came quickly because they could no longer lift themselves up. The body would sag and the pressure upon the lungs and upon the heart would cause fairly quick death. Barbaric. Jesus left heaven's throne to take on the likeness of man and he suffered horribly as he hung there on the cross. But when he uttered the words, it is finished. His sufferings were finally over. And he would never suffer again. Praise God. We have that same hope. Many of you have suffered. Suffered heartbreak. Many of you have wrestled with health problems. Many of you have had trials that have just wore you out. There's coming a day when we will also be able to say, it is finished. I'm thinking about Sandy's father. He's been fighting for a long time, but his suffering is just about to end. It is just about finished. Perhaps the greatest passage in the Bible, Revelation 21.4, about our suffering being over. Revelation 21.4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. I'm looking for that day. That day when I can have that glorified body. Miss Odell, we won't have to worry about no prescription glasses. Amen. I won't have to worry about no hearing aids. I won't have to worry about my chompers wearing out. James was walking out of here, just limping out. I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just put some three-in-one oil on all those aches and pains? He goes, boy, that would be a lot, lot more simple if we could do that. We won't have to. We'll be given that glorified body. We'll be able to run and leap and climb, jump like we used to, running down that street of gold. We won't age. We won't have to worry about social security or any of those things for all eternity our bodies will be the way that we've always wanted them to be praise god for that it'll be finished secondly when jesus said it is finished all sacrifices were finished when adam and eve sinned mankind became a fallen race and there was a penalty for sin that must be paid god's righteousness demands a penalty for sin. Abel brought a lamb and offered it to God. Noah offered a sacrifice after the flood. In Exodus chapter 12, the children of Israel killed the Passover lamb on the eve of their exodus from Egypt, placed the blood upon the doorpost, forming the sign of the cross. And throughout the Old Testament, the blood of bulls and goats was shed to cover the sins of the people. It could never take away the sins but merely covered it. But it pictured what would happen the day the Lamb of God would come and take away the sins of the world. The Lord Jesus is that Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world and He offered Himself as a sacrifice not to cover mankind's sins, but to wash them away. Now Hebrews 10, verse 11 and 12 says this, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And you can just pencil in the words, it is finished. Once for all, he offered himself as the sacrifice for our sins. Once for all, and after that time, no sacrifice would ever be needed again. Because of Jesus' finished work at Calvary, animal sacrifices were a waste of time after that point. Did they continue? Yeah, they continued for a short while. The Pharisees were stubborn about that. They would not recognize Jesus as the Messiah, and they wanted things to continue as they once had. So they did for a short while. 
But by 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, God put an end to all animal sacrifices from that day until now. Now it's interesting to note that in the temple, once a year, the high priest would go behind the veil to the Holy of Holies and offer blood, a blood sacrifice on the mercy seat. We looked at that in our Sunday school lesson on the temple. He would offer the blood on behalf of the people. When Jesus declared, it is finished, immediately the veil in that temple was ripped in two by the hand of God. Let's take a quick look at it. Matthew chapter 27. Everything has a meaning. Matthew 27, beginning with verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. He said the words, It is finished. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Two things. Symbolically, this was God's way of saying animal sacrifices are finished. You can try to continue with it, but it is a meaningless sacrifice. It's done. Before only the high priest had access to God. Once a year. Can you imagine that? Once a year, the high priest would go into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. But from the moment that veil was ripped in two, it was God's way of letting us know we all have access to God at any time or any moment. That's a wonderful thing. I'm a child of the King. I don't have to wait once a year to talk to God. We are told to come boldly into the presence of God. Did they put up a new veil? Did they just mend the old one? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say they probably put up a new one. But it was closing the barn door after the cows have gone. They could have put up a new veil, mended the old veil, but it was just meaningless because it was done. That chapter was closed. There hasn't been any animal sacrifices in Jerusalem since 70 AD. Number three, when Jesus said it is finished, the scriptures were finished. What scriptures? Those passages that spoke of the coming Messiah. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he fulfilled over 300 Old Testament scriptures about the coming Messiah. What about that? Throughout the scriptures, prophecy pointed to the day when the Messiah would come. Well, he did come. 2,000 years ago, the Messiah came as the Lamb of God, and now it is finished. Those Jews are still waiting for the Messiah. They done missed the boat. Oh, he's coming again. But when he comes again, it won't be as a Lamb of God. It will be as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, as a conquering king at the end of the tribulation. Well, he'll come first in the rapture, but when he comes again, different stages of his coming, they'll realize that him who they pierced was the Messiah. The scriptures were finished. And number four, I like this one. Satan was finished. The night Jesus was betrayed, he said it was very heavy and sorrowful unto death. I believe the devil and his demons were hitting Jesus with every fiery dart they had in their arsenal. I believe Jesus thought that his heart might break and that he would not make it to Calvary's cross. He was sorrowful unto death. When he prayed, his sweat was as great drops of blood, which can only happen when the body is under incredible stress. When Jesus was taken captive, the devil encouraged those soldiers to abuse Jesus in the most horrific, barbaric way. And each time they hit Jesus, I can see the devil on the sidelines saying, hit him again, hit him again, hit him harder! When Jesus died on the cross, the devil thought he had won. By the time Jesus' body was in the grave, them devils were probably throwing themselves apart. But that Easter morning, when the stone was rolled away, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes.
Hallelujah. He arose. He arose. He arose. The devil realized he was finished. He could not defeat the Son of God. Death was defeated. Sin was defeated. And the devil was defeated. Hallelujah. The devil's still stirring up trouble here on earth, but he's running out of time. And for the record, he can't touch a believer without God's permission. That's a defeated foe. He may go about as a roaring lion, but God's pulled out all his teeth and removed all his claws. That's a defeated foe. This should be a comfort and encouragement to all Christians that the devil is finished. Number five, our sin debt was finished. As stated earlier, there is a penalty for sin. Romans 6.23 declares, for the wages of sin is death. Mankind can't work his way to heaven. Our works can't pay off our sin debt. I wasn't kicking dirt, but this morning I just mentioned in passing black smoke, white smoke, there ain't no hope in the pole. <laughs> Rebecca shared how People at her office got no interest in Jesus, no interest in God, but they're just all on Twitter about this Pope thing. They're putting all of their hope in the Pope, and he's just a man. He can't take away your sins. He can't die for your sins. And that's where they're missing it. If they're not glorifying the Pope, they're praying to Mary, not realizing that Jesus alone is our hope. Amen. Hebrews 9.22 And almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Jesus said it is finished. The Greek word that is used is testelestai and the word means paid in full. Our debt of sin has been paid in full. This is why salvation is a free gift. You can't buy it. You can't work for it. Because as the song declares, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. Jesus washed it white as snow. Amen. In days gone by, they had a place called Debtor's Prison. If you ever go to that historic jail in Mount Holly, they'll tell you about Debtor's Prison. Those who couldn't pay their debts were thrown in jail till their debt was paid through time served. The only way they could get out of Debtor's Prison is if some wealthy relative would bail them out. If they did, the words paid in full were written across their debts. And that's what Jesus did. He paid in full our sin debt. So now it is finished. Hallelujah. Number five, our sin debt was finished. Number six, them scoffers were finished. Those that had said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. That crowd that mockingly said, if you be the Son of God, let him come down from the cross. I don't know if you realize the cruelness of those statements. To watch somebody be crucified in itself was something that the normal person could not do. It was a horrific thing to behold. Not only did they state, watch it like they were watching a movie, but they mocked him each step of the way. Oh, if he is the Son of God, let's see him come down off that cross. Well, Jesus could have done it. He could have done it. And that still wouldn't have made an impression on him. They would have said, oh, he's, uh, he was faking it all along. Whatever. Same crowd today. They said that Jesus didn't die on the cross. He, he merely passed out. And when they put him in that tomb, he came to and just crawled out of that place. Yeah, okay. When Jesus arose from that tomb, those scoffers weren't laughing no more. Jesus had risen from the dead, and as Galatians 6, 7 declares, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. They were mocking him as he hung on the cross. They ain't mocking him now. Everything Jesus said he'd do, he did, and then it was finished. Number seven, his work was finished. Jesus realized at a very young age he had work to do. They took that journey to Jerusalem. They returned home halfway there. They realized Jesus, was, Jesus wasn't in the caravan. For three days they searched for Jesus. I don't know why it took them so long not to check the temple out. I would have gone there if for nothing else just to pray. That's where they found Jesus with the rabbis asking questions and, and speaking. 
When they asked him what he was doing, he said, No, you're not, that I must be about my father's business. Jesus knew as a young man there was business to take care of. John 9, 4, Jesus declared, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Jesus wasn't talking about work in the night shift. He was talking about death when no man can work because they're dead. We as Christians need to be time conscious and realize whatever we hope to accomplish for the glory of God, we've got to get going now today because the clock is ticking and it's later than we think. There may come a time when we're not physically able to do the things that we want to do now. And then it will be too late. We must take advantage of the time that God gives us because we got no guarantee of tomorrow. <clears throat> Secondly, we also must finish what we started. Some Christians have trouble with commitment. Committing to a marriage, committing to a church, committing to any work they're called to do, committing to a job. And that's a bad habit to fall into. Others take on more than they can handle. Their heart is in the right place, but they, they got too many irons in the fire and end up not doing any of those things very well. Others are simply quitters. They never finish what they started. And once you get into that mode of a quitter's mentality, it'll be a pattern for your life. You'll find yourself quitting everything when things get rough. We got to stick it out. We've got to determine that nothing and no one is going to stop us in our service from the Lord. Jesus was determined to finish what he had started. He set his face like a flint, like a piece of granite, and he wasn't going to let nothing stand in his way of going to Calvary's cross Amen. for our sins. Yes. We've got to have that same type of mentality. I call it a bulldog mentality. If a bulldog bites you, you can't get that bulldog off. He locks his jaws on you, and he's going to be on there for a good while. That's the same kind of attitude we have to have in our service for the king. A bulldog mentality. I ain't letting go of God. Amen. When Jesus said, it is finished, his work was done. I want to close with this. There was a song that was written when I first got saved. made a real impression. I wish I could sing it for you, but I'm not going to. But it's a song written by the Gaithers and it's a song called It Is Finished. Just listen to these words. There's a line that has been drawn through the ages. On that line stands an old rugged cross. On that cross a battle is raging for the gain of men's souls or his loss. The earth shakes with the force of the conflict and the sun refuses to shine for there hangs God's son in the balance. And then, through the darkness, he cries, It is finished. The battle is over. It is finished. There will be no more war. It is finished. The end of the conflict. It is finished. And Jesus is Lord. Still in my heart, the battle was raging. Not all prisoners of war have come home. There were battlefields of my own making. I did not know that the war had been won. Then I heard that the king of the ages had fought all those battles for me. And that victory was mine for the claiming. And now, praise his name, I am free. It is finished. The battle is over. It is finished. There will be no more war. It is finished. The end of the conflict. It is finished. And Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Dear God.